10 Tragic Unsolved Cases of Families, Despite what we see in popular horror and home invasion movies like Funny Games, somebody breaking into a person's home and murdering their entire family isn't a common occurrence. When entire families are murdered, it's often a case of familicide, in which the mass murderer is a family member. However, entire families are sometimes murdered by a lone psychopath or somebody bent on revenge. Tragically, some of these rare cases are never solved. 1. The Tan Siblings On the morning of January 6, 1979, four children from the Tan family were violently murdered in their Housing and Development Board HDB, flat. The four children, aged between 5 and 10 years old, were found slashed to death in the bathroom of their one-room flat in Block 58 Galing Baru. Their parents, Mr. and Mrs. Tan Quenchai, were at work when the murders took place. The murders remain unsolved. The victims were Tan Kok Bang, 10, Tan Kok Hin, 8, Tan Kok Soon, 6, and their sister, Tan Chin Ne, 5. The three boys studied at Ben Demir Road Primary School, while their sister attended a nearby Pap Kindergarten. At 6.35 a.m., the Tans left their flat to transport students to school in their minibus, which they operated together. Their children were sleeping when they left. Mrs. Tan telephoned home at 7.10 a.m. to wake them up as usual, but received no response after three separate calls. She then asked one of her neighbors to help wake them up. The neighbor knocked on the door of their flat, but also received no response. The Tans arrived home after 10 a.m. and Mrs. Tan found the slashed bodies of her children in the bathroom. The four children were found in t-shirts and pants and all four had slash wounds on their heads. Slash wounds were also found on Chin Mei's face and Kok Pang's right arm was almost severed. Six, According to the pathologist's report, each child had a minimum of 20 slash wounds on his or her body. The police concluded that the murders were premediated and that the perpetrator, or perpetrators had taken care to avoid leaving incriminating evidence behind. However, there were blood stains in the kitchen sink and the killer or killers were believed to have cleaned themselves before leaving the flat. There was no evidence of forced entry, and the flat was not ransacked nor were there any items reported missing. The murder weapons, believed to be a chopper taken from the kitchen of the flat as well as a dagger, were not found. The investigation into the murders was conducted by the Criminal Investigation Department's Special Investigation Section. They did not establish a definitive motive but acknowledged the possibility of the killings being motivated by revenge. Mrs. Tan's brother told the media that the murders could have been related to an illegal Tantine scheme, and police pursued the possibility of the killer being a discontented gambler. However, that angle of investigations did not lead to the murderer and the Tans told the media that they had not offended anyone. The police also believed the murderer or murderers had intimate knowledge of the Tans and their background, as they were apparently aware that Mrs. Tan had undergone sterilization, after the birth of her last child. In addition, the Tans received a Chinese New Year card two weeks after the murder, which may or may not have been a hoax. The card showed happy children at play and taunted them with the words now you can have no more offspring ha 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 and was signed the murderer in Mandarin. The sender of the card also appeared to have intimate knowledge of the family as they addressed the Tans by their nicknames, Achai and Ai. On January 7, 1979, homicide investigators questioned two women in connection to the murders but later released them not commenting if the women were of help. Despite interviewing over 100 of the Tan family's neighbors and public appeals for witnesses, the police had difficulties obtaining useful information. Residents in the area claimed a witness had seen Chin Nei struggling with a man from his flat in another block, but the witness could not be located. The children's parents were also questioned by police. A witness told Chinese newspapers he saw a couple, one of them bloodstained, leaving the scene of the murder but police investigations later revealed it to be a hoax. One of the Tan's neighbors, 68-year-old Yam Yin Tin, said she usually sat along the common corridor to watch children playing, and would have seen anyone coming and going from the Tan family's flat. However, on the morning of the murders, she was washing her hair and did not see anyone entering or leaving the Tan's flat. A taxi driver from Toa later reported that a man in his 20s, who walked with a lurch had boarded his taxi near Block 96 along Kalangbaru Road, near the location of the murder, 
At about 8 a.m. that morning, the taxi driver said that the man had blood stains on the left side of his body and carried a knife that banged against the taxi door when he alighted at Lavender Street. Mr. Tan matched the taxi driver's description to a neighbor of his, a young man who visited the family's flat almost daily to use their phone, and who was known as uncle to the whole family, in a police lineup. The taxi driver picked out the neighbor as the man who had boarded his taxi. However, the neighbor was released after two weeks due to a lack of evidence connecting him to the murders. The man, who was Malaysian, later moved out of Block 58 with his sister. The children were buried at Cha Chu Kang Cemetery on January 7, 1979, together with their school bags, books and toys. Mrs. Tan passed out several times as her children were being placed in their respective coffins. The murderer or murderers were never caught and brought to justice. Soon after the tragedy, the Tans gave up their minibus operation and found work at a plastic bag machining firm. A year after the gruesome murders, the Tans were featured in the Straits Times and referred to their home as Four Walls of Emptiness. The Tans also registered with the Social Welfare Department, hoping to adopt two children. Eventually, Mrs. Tan underwent a sterilization reversal operation and was able to conceive again. On December 30, 1983, at the age of 35, she gave birth to a baby boy. The Straits Times noted the brutality of the murders and described them as the most inhuman in Singapore's crime history. The newspaper also described police sources as being shaken and sickened by the murders. Although investigators took several people into custody for questioning, nobody seemed to have any connection with the murders. Since then, the case has become one of Singapore's most infamous unsolved crimes. 2. The Sums Family they remain the most shocking, culture-changing murders in Tallahassee history. The 1966 Sims murders, in which a man, his wife and youngest daughter were brutally slain in their north side home. The murders were never solved, but on Thursday, Tallahassee author Henry Cabbage is going to name the killers, or at least strongly suggest the guilty parties, during a talk to the Tallahassee Historical Society. My attorney said, you gathered all this through public records, Cabbage said. The suspects are named in public records. Cabbage, 67, is a former newspaper reporter who spent 26 years as the public information director for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. He wrote a history column in the 1990s for the defunct weekly newspaper, The Tallahassean. In 1999, he published Tallahassee Historical Tales an engaging collection of stories about local history ranging from Spanish explorer Hernando de Soto's winter encampment in 1539-1540, to the 1843 fire that destroyed Tallahassee to the Wakola volcano. Cabbage also spent several years working on a book about the Simza murders. The book was stymied by the refusal of law enforcement agencies to release their files. They claimed it was was an ongoing investigation. In 2001, Cabbage lost a lawsuit to force release of the records, but a year later, then Leon County Sheriff Larry Campbell turned over more than 2,000 pages of records since 1987. Though Cabbage has abandoned plans to write a book, he remains fascinated by the case. There is no apparent reason why the Simpsons should have been targeted. It was a very middle-class, church-going family, whose children were good students at Ram Middle School and Leon High. Cabbage said, the Simses were unlikely victims, but they were victims. The Sims murders occurred October 22, 1966. It was a Saturday night and Mississippi State was playing Florida State in football. Robert and Helen Sims, and their daughter Joy Comet 12, were listening to the game on radio at their home at 641 Muriel Court, a cul-de-sac off Gibbs Drive. Two older daughters, Jeannie 17, and Judy, 16 were babysitting for families attending the football game. When Jeannie returned at 11.15 p.m., she found her parents and sister murdered. All three were tied up and their mouths stuffed with stockings. The parents were blindfolded. Robert Sims, 42, a high-ranking official with the Department of Education, had been shot once in the head. Helen Sims, 34, had been shot twice in the head and once in the leg. Joy was stabbed six times and shot once in the head. Robert and Joy were dead at the scene, 
Helen Sims died five days later. Body temperatures indicated the killers had left just moments before Jeannie returned home. Muriel Court is on a ridge behind the Northwood Mall, overlooking a creek. A drainage ditch behind the Sims' home goes down to the creek. Investigators speculate that's how the killers approached the house. Tallahassee residents reacted with shock and fear to the murders, which occupied the front page of the paper for days. Residents rushed to buy guns. Women filled water pistols with ammonia. Parents kept their children at home. Tallahassee was then a sleepy southern town of about 55,000 residents who kept their doors unlocked and assumed crime happened in big cities. The common trope is Tallahassee lost its innocence with the Sims murders. The murders were never solved, though police spent years pursuing leads. An early suspect was C.A. Roberts, pastor of First Baptist Church. Roberts was rumored to be having an affair with Helen Sims, a church secretary, who had resigned days before. Campbell then a sheriff's detective, eventually ruled out Roberts, the FSU team chaplain. He could be seen in game film on the sideline of the football game. Yet Campbell made the case his holy grail, chasing leads for the next 48 years before his death in December. He died certain he knew who had committed the murders, two high school students, a boy and his girlfriend, who lived nearby and reportedly had a taste for the morbid. In 1987, the girl sought out Campbell asking hypothetically what would happen if she confessed to the murders. When Campbell said she would go to prison, she backed off a confession, and Campbell could never come up with the evidence to convict her and her boyfriend. In those days, we didn't have the scientific capabilities to examine evidence. We do now. If this happened now, we'd have somebody in jail tomorrow, Campbell said in 2011. I think I could go to a grand jury and get an indictment, but we couldn't prove it in court. Though Campbell would never state publicly the names of the boy and girl, who reportedly are still alive, Cabbage intends to Thursday. Cabbage has the tapes from Campbell's 1987 interviews with the woman and will play a few excerpts. He also will talk about several other suspects, the crime scene and the impact on Tallahassee. You ask anybody who lived here in 1966, and they can tell you exactly where they were what they were doing when they heard about the case, said Cabbage a Panama City native who moved to Tallahassee in 1984. It so changed Tallahassee. Today, people still shiver thinking about that case. Henry Cabbage will talk about the Sims murders at the monthly meeting of the Tallahassee Historical Society on Thursday at 7 p.m. in the City Commission Chambers at City Hall. The talk is open to the public. 3. The Maps Family On the evening of January 21, 1962, authorities in Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania arrived at the burning home of 39-year-old Edward Howard Maps, who lived there with his 22-year-old wife, Christine, and their four-month-old daughter, Julie Louise. A series of small fires had been started throughout the house, but most of them burned out, because the windows were shut and the fires couldn't get enough oxygen. In the kitchen, the oven door was open, and the oven was set to 450 degrees and pumping gas into the house. Christine was discovered unconscious on the kitchen floor, as she had been bludgeoned with a blunt object which was never found. Julie Louise was found in an adjacent room, dead of smoke inhalation. Edward Maps was missing. When Christine died at the hospital a few hours later, a warrant was issued for Edward's arrest and he was soon added to the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives list. Maps was known as a colorful, eccentric beatnik artist who mostly lived off a trust fund and never held down a regular steady job. It was suspected that he couldn't handle the responsibility of being a husband and father anymore and decided to murder his family, so he could take off and start over. However, the crime took the whole community by surprise as they considered Edward to be a kind man who adored his family. Even though Maps had developed some mental issues and was diagnosed with schizophrenia shortly after serving with the Marines in World War II, he showed no propensity towards violence. Indeed. There were a lot of things about the crime which didn't make sense, such as, earlier that night, the entire Maps family had visited a neighbor and appeared to be in great spirits. Somehow, within the span of just over an hour, Edward suddenly decided to murder his family, set fire to his house and run away both of the family's vehicles were left behind in the garage. There were no reports of any buses, taxis or hitchhikers in the area that night, nor any sightings of Maps leaving town. So what did he use for transportation? Edward's wallet, passport and bank books were left behind and the house's front door was locked, 
From the outside a plate was found next to Julia which was stained with animal blood and some items in the house had animal fur on them, this evidence made no sense, as the Maps family did not own any pets days later. A local woman received a threatening phone call from a man calling himself John Birch who stated, you're next, while police thought the call was likely a hoax. The woman seemed certain the caller was Edward Maps another acquaintance of Maps named Henry Evans received a call from someone claiming to be him, who stated, when you see Bob, I want you to tell him that I forgive him, likely in reference to Maps father-in-law, Robert Wolbach, when Evans advised the caller to turn himself in. He said he had too many things to do before hanging up eight months later, a man matching Maps' description robbed $3,000 from a bank in New Jersey which happened to be located only five miles away from his original hometown of Passaic in 1966, the day before the Maps' wedding anniversary. An unknown individual left flowers on Christine and Julie Louise's graves anyway. In December 1967, the local district attorney requested the FBI remove Maps' name from the 10 most wanted list, even though Maps' disappearance automatically made him the prime suspect. The problem was that there was no hard evidence that he committed the crime, so the DA felt it would be difficult to build a successful prosecution against him. But in recent years, information has surfaced to suggest that Kirstein's father, Robert Wolbach, might have been the real perpetrator and disposed of Edward's body to frame him for the crime. Robert did not approve of the marriage between Edward and Christine and thought his son-in-law was a no-good bum. At one point, the two men got into an argument and Robert literally slapped Edward across the face. Only a few months before the murders, Robert's marriage to his own wife, Julia, fell apart after he became violent and started accusing her of having an affair with Edward. As a result, the Wolbank separated and Robert moved to New York. On the night of the murders, Robert was allegedly on a plane from Miami to New York City and claimed he arrived and checked into the Chesterfield Hotel at 3.15 a.m. However, there were a few inconsistencies in his story. Robert claimed that he flew out of Miami on Alaska Airlines, but no Alaska Airlines flights left Miami that night. When a family friend attempted to contact Robert at the Chesterfield Hotel at 4 a.m. to inform him about Kirstein's death, the hotel said he hadn't checked in yet and the friend couldn't actually get a hold of Robert until 8.10 a.m. It's worth noting that Robert had suffered a heart attack the previous summer, so he probably wouldn't have been in the best of health to travel to Strasbourg and commit the murders himself. However, some people have speculated that Wolbach might have hired someone to commit the crime, that said. There is no evidence placing Wolbach in Strasbourg that night or tying him to the murder scene. It is a baffling case, as when you try to concoct a theory pointing to Edward Maps, Robert Wolbach or a third party as the culprit, none of them make 100% complete sense. I attempt to analyze this case on the latest episode of my new crime podcast, The Trail Went Cold. 4. The Bryka Family September 27th doesn't come and go on the west side without people talking about it. The murder of three on a quiet, suburban street in Bridgetown still haunts the tight-knit Green Township community. Lori Harnest and Pauline West have lived in the area for most of their lives, and say they remember it like it was yesterday. Somebody brings it up, the Bryka murder, every year, said West. It shook up the whole neighborhood, people were scared to death. People were afraid to go out of their house. Then there was rumors of who did it. It was never, ever proven. Investigators say the Bright murders have generated the most gossip of any local cold case. It was on the news every night. We probably heard about it first from Al Scott Ocott, said West. On a chilly September night in 1966, 28-year-old Jerry Bryka, an engineer at the Monsanto Plastics facility in Addiston, was stabbed to death in his home on Greenway Avenue along with his 23-year-old wife Linda and their four-year-old daughter Debbie. Investigators say the murders happened on Sunday, September 25, 1966. The bodies were discovered two days later. The last person to see Jerry alive was Joan Jensen, a neighbor taking her dog for a walk around 8.45 p.m. on Sunday night. Jerry was taking out the garbage. On Monday, Jerry missed his flight to West Virginia. His office called the house several times but no one answered. By Tuesday, the neighbors were starting to worry. The garbage cans were still outside, the floodlights were on and the dogs were barking. The police report shows that Linda was placed on top of Jerry, 
He had a sock in his mouth and both had been stabbed several times. Nine on your side talked to one of the neighbors that found the bodies. He did not want to be identified, mainly because he was harassed right after the murder, and took a lie detector test before being cleared as a suspect. Well, the garbage cans were out and I didn't hear the dogs anytime. Then I knew something was up and the lights were on, said the neighbor. I wanted to go into the house but I didn't want to go by myself. No one on the street had seen the family for two days at this point. We went over and I opened that front door and the odor was so horrific that I came around the back here and called police. You don't forget something like that. Linda was a former airline flight attendant from Chicago. She met Jerry on a flight to Seattle where Jerry was working at the Monsanto company there. The family moved to Bridgetown in 1963 from Seattle. Linda worked part-time at the Glenway Vet Clinic. There were rumors for years that she could have had an affair with the vet. Hamilton County Coroner Dr. Frank Cleveland said someone had recent sex with Linda Brico when her body was found. Some have tried to tie the Brike murders to the murder of the Valerie Percy in Chicago. Percy was the daughter of former Illinois Senator Charles Percy. She was murdered a week before the Brikes. They were both from upper-class Chicago families, went to the same high school and had attended the same flight attendant program. Percy was also stabbed to death. Police were unable to interrogate the main suspect in the case due to a recent ruling on Miranda rights by the Supreme Court. They never found a weapon. No one was ever charged and rumors of a love triangle between Linda and the veteran Aryan were always just that, rumors. While these case files may be 46 years old, Hamilton County detectives Douglas Todd and Brian Williams are still combing through the 400 interviews, trying to piece it together. I've taken these interview books and read through them two or three times, and I've made notes of stuff that really wasn't documented before said Todd. Detectives are hoping the coroner's office will be able to extract DNA from the fluid and hair samples they submitted in 2010 and 2012. Hamilton County Coroner Dr. Lakshmi Samarco showed nine on your side the evidence bags and explained where the testing stands. Most of the evidence was collected 40 plus years ago and before a time when there was DNA analysis, therefore they didn't know what to collect, how to collect it how to preserve it and how to submit it for evaluation, said Dr. Samarco. Now, some of the evidence from the Brica murder is going to be looked at by the FBI. We've reached out to the FBI. They have a more robust laboratory in the D.C. area in Quantico, so we are trying to see how they can help us and we are trying to extract different aspects of mitochondria DNA, which is something that they do the best in the country, Dr. Samarco said. Dr. Samarco says the code is, the combined DNA index system, wasn't widely used until the 90s. She says the only way you could match the DNA is if the perpetrator's DNA is already in the system. If a match was made, the sheriff's office would turn it over to Hamilton County Prosecutor Joe Deters. We would absolutely go after whoever did this if they are still alive, even if they are not. This case has affected so many people that we'd like to get some closure for everyone in the community said Deters. Deters went on to say the homicide investigators are some of the best in the country, and he is surprised no one has ever been caught talking about their involvement. It's pretty rare, especially today, to have a genuine cold case and in this particular case, it's odd that, someone, would commit something like this and never utter a word about it to anybody. Usually people get in trouble, because they shoot their mouths off about it, and in this case, as far as we know, no one has ever said anything, said Deters. Everyone nine on your side talked to, from the coroner to the detectives, are positive about the possibility of solving this case. For all the people involved, for everyone that has voiced their opinions and hearing from their friends, their stories and their recollections of it. I just think that for the west side of Cincinnati it would be tremendous, said Williams. I wouldn't see why it wouldn't. We're still working on the case. We're still working with the coroner's office on evidence recently submitted. We have every intention on solving it," said Todd. Nine on your side went to Columbus to talk to Ohio Attorney General Mike DeWine about this case and his unsolved crimes database. The Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigations database provides details and photos related to unsolved homicides and solicits tips from the public to assist local law enforcement in pursuing their investigations. I think we owe the victims' families our best efforts, said DeWine. We can't tell them that we're ever going to solve the homicide of their husband or brother, sister or child, but we ought to be able to tell them, 
Hey, we are going to do our best and we're going to stay at it. Whoever the victim is to you has not been forgotten. We are going to stay on this we are going to keep working on it. DeWine says Cincinnati's local departments have been diligent in pursuing these difficult cases and helping document them. The Cincinnati Police Department has been very cooperative. They've put in over 300 unsolved homicides so far. We think statewide we have 5,000 unsolved homicides. We have already about 1,300 in the database, said DeWine. The case has, really never been put down for a long period of time. I was told back in the day when detectives were first starting out they were assigned this case to look at and investigate. This was a lot of guys' first case when they came in because they would like to get a fresh perspective on what the case was about and their ideas," said Todd. 5. The Diggs Family It all began with Jean. 39-year-old wife and mother, Jean Diggs, was last seen alive by unnamed neighbors on the day of her own untimely death. She was noted as seeming depressed most of the time, but was especially so that day. Jean was known to be a beautiful woman, and a great mother. She was always supportive of her husband but quite dependent on him for emotional support. Wesley Diggs was her life, but the more time he spent in the city the less time he had for her. She understood that he was working very hard, trying to make a go of the businesses, and she wanted to help, especially if that would bring her into his world. She wanted to get a small, part-time job to help him financially, even though he would refuse. They'd been through this before. Jean figured that she'd be able to help by paying some of the bills. She'd not have to depend on him to provide for her daily money needs. The bottom line was that she was breaking down. Jean began spending more and more time alone within the prison-like walls of her home, behind closed doors and shaded windows. This isn't to imply that she was totally devoid of neighborhood contacts. In fact, one of the last people she visited and talked to on the fatal weekend lived but a few doors away. Jean sat in her living room for a long time, in an eerie state of silence, almost catatonic, then suddenly spoke decidedly saying, there, her children, better off with God. On the third floor of the Diggs colonial style house was Allison Diggs, 16 years. This area was renovated to hold space enough for two bedrooms. Allison was in her bed with her television, turned on, between her and the door. She was reaching for the window when the shooter fired. Hardly seems like a stressful position to be in one at gunpoint, meaning she must have known and trusted the shooter. In the second room of the third floor, everything was in its place. The room was completely furnished with bedding, except for the empty pillowcase on the bed. Moving down to the second floor, where Wesley Jr., 5 years, and Roger Diggs, 12 years, rooms were. The boys were in their beds when the shooter fired and there were blood flow discrepancies where the bullets entered the mattresses, drying patterns present. On the second floor was the oldest daughter Audrey, 17 years. She was found on her bed, fully clothed. The blood stains indicated that her body had been moved to the bed, and she was not shot there. The crime scene was clearly tampered with. Audrey was shot at least twice as much as the others were, so she was not so friendly with the shooter. Down to the basement. Jean Diggs was found sitting with her legs outstretched, with one hand touching the floor. She sat upright and slumped backwards. Oddly, there was a great deal of blood in the area. No weapons were present. The only missing items from the home were the pillow and the 22 caliber handgun that belonged to Wesley Diggs' collection. The younger children were found in their pajamas, leading investigators to believe that they might have been killed the previous night. Somebody who was familiar with the house might have slipped in and ambushed the family as they were getting ready for bed. Some members of the community suggested that Wesley, who wasn't home that night and later passed a lie detector test might have known more than he let on to the police. Richard K. Zinsey, the lead investigator on the case, speculated that it was a revenge killing by somebody trying to get back at Wesley. Wesley, however, insisted that he had told the authorities everything he knew. Annoyed at public suspicion that he was the killer, Wesley expressed harsh disappointment with how the investigation was conducted. At one point, he asked for the FBI to be brought in. His request was denied. He died in 1985 never knowing exactly what happened to his family. 6. The Wolf Family Probably everyone who grew up at Turtle Lake, N.D., has heard the story of the murdered family, an immigrant Germans from Russia farmer and his wife who were brutally slain on their homestead along with five of their daughters and their hired boy. 
Author and former UND professor Vernon Keel certainly did. He grew up in Turtle Lake, driving tractor and doing farm work for his half-brothers before leaving in 1958, to join the Navy. He knew the place three miles north of Turtle Lake, where Jacob and Beata Wolf and their family had lived and died. You grew up being very much aware of this tragic story, Keel said in an interview from his home in Denver. You would find yourself at the cemetery from time to time where they were buried. When I was growing up, it was overgrown with lilacs. There, eight small markers and a large monument mark the wolf's resting place. Part of the inscription on the big stone says, Die remorted firmly, the murdered family. The murdered family is the title Keel chose for his book, now in bookstores, written as historical fiction about those sorrowful, terrifying events. The book's release closely coincides with the 90th anniversary of the murders April 22. The crime was discovered by friends of the family who went to check on them after Jacob Wolf failed to pick up a piece of farm equipment he had intended to borrow. What they found at the Wolf Farm was straight out of a horror movie. Jacob and Beata, their daughters, Bertha, 12, Maria, 9, Edna, 7, Lydia, 5, and Martha, 3 and their 13-year-old hired boy, Jacob Hofer, a relative by marriage, had all been shot to death. The only survivor was the wolf's eight-month-old daughter, Emma, found crying and hungry in her crib. Just three weeks later, eager investigators had gotten a signed confession from Henry Layer, a neighbor farmer who had a quarrel with Jacob Wolf. At the time, the New York Times called it the most rapid administration of justice in the country. Layer was immediately sentenced to the North Dakota Penitentiary, where he died in 1925. Keel's father, who was 55 years old when Vernon was born, had known the Wolfs and Henry Layer. He had visited Layer in prison. When Keel asked, his father would tell him what he knew about the crimes. Years passed, and Keel, with a doctorate from the University of Minnesota, taught media law and headed journalism and communication schools at South Dakota State University, UND and Wichita State University. Whenever Keel thought of stories he'd like to research and write, the murdered family from his own hometown came to mind. When he actually began investigating, the story turned out to have some surprises. In 2008, doing research at the UND library, Keel found a copy of the Bismarck Tribune from 1920 that had a story about the murders that included a copy of Henry Lair's confession. Later, Keel learned from longtime attorney Jack McDonald in Bismarck, that Lair had spent the rest of his life in prison trying to appeal that confession to the North Dakota Supreme Court. Lair denied his guilt, and said he had confessed under duress, intimidation and fear. He'd been beaten by officers, forced to stare at pictures of the victims and told an angry mob was waiting outside the jail to lynch him if he was released. Layer said authorities told him the penitentiary was the safest place for him to wait for things to die down. Then, he was told, he could file a change of plea and receive a jury trial, Keel said. There was no physical evidence to connect Layer to the murders, but people were scared and investigators and others wanted the case resolved quickly. The cast of characters was one of the things I found really fascinating. Keel said, this murder and this investigation were tied up in the nature of the political struggles that were going on at the time. In 1915, the Nonpartisan League had been formed in North Dakota and its candidate, Lynn Frazier, became governor. William Langer, later governor and senator, was attorney general at the time of the murders and was about to try to oust Frazier. After Langer, William Lemke, later a congressman, was attorney general over the case. These were pretty high-powered politicians who had ambitions to go on in government and, in fact, did, Keel said. In his research, Keel read newspaper accounts as well as court records and sworn statements from neighbors. He wrote the book as historical fiction so he could tell a more complete story and bring the people in it back to life. The Murdered Family, by Vernon Keel, published by Wanamaker Press, is 350 pages, a website www.themurderedfamily.com slash, contains information about the book and the author, plus photos of the family, their homestead and of the crowd that gathered at their farm on the day of the funeral. The photos, unfortunately, are not in the book. 7. The Dardine Family More than a quarter century later, the grisly, unsolved slaughter of Joe Ian Dardine's son, his pregnant wife and their young son in southern Illinois still haunts her. Bludgeoned with a baseball bat along with her three-year-old son, 
30-year-old Ruby Elaine Dardine gave birth during that 1987, attacking the family's home in the 2,500 resident village of Vina. The killer took no mercy on the newborn either, ending her life as quickly as it began. The household's patriarch, Russell Keith Dardine, turned up dead the next day in a wheat field, his body mutilated. No one has been brought to justice in the Jefferson County case where the most promising lead was Tommy Lynn Sell's claim he carried out the killings, among the as many as 70 he took credit for in various states as a drifter and carnival worker. Authorities ultimately linked him to nearly two dozen murders. But because of questions about the veracity of his supposed confession, the Dardine murders were not among them. The answer to the question of whether Sells killed the Dardines or the family's killer is still on the loose is more elusive than ever. That's because Sells, at 49, went to his own death earlier this month in a Texas execution chamber for the 1999, stabbing death of an acquaintance's 13-year-old daughter. Joanne Dardine doesn't believe Sells was the one who wiped out her son's family. She dismisses Sells' claims that Keith Dardine happened upon Sells at a gas station and invited him home for a three-way tryst with Dardine's pregnant wife. Keith Dardine, the lead singer at a tiny Baptist church where his wife played piano, was too protective of his family to entertain such a thing. His mother says, Tommy deserved to die for what he did, but I wanted him to stay alive until I know positively he didn't do it. Joeen Dardine, a 76-year-old from Mount Carmel, Hill, told the Associated Press in a Friday telephone interview. She sent police to check on her son's family at their home, 80 miles southeast of Street, Louis, on November 17, 1987, after Keith Dardine failed to show up for work at a local water plant. Authorities found Elaine Dardine with her son and her newborn baby all dead and positioned on a waterbed. Hunters found Keith Dardine's body the next day a mile away. The brutality of the crime was just extreme. So terrible and egregious, said Gary Duncan, the county's top prosecutor for 17 years, until his 2008 retirement. It was a constellation of really awful facts. Suspects were scarce before Sells got busted in Texas for killing 13-year-old Kayleen Harris by stabbing her 16 times. Sells soon began confessing to killings elsewhere. The Texas investigator who first arrested Sells in Harris' death said Sells often claimed he'd wake up in unfamiliar places and have blood on him. He said his tools of death ranged from guns and knives to an ice pick and his bare hands. In claiming he was to blame for the Dardine family's demise, Sells accurately described certain details of the massacre, some of which he could have gleaned from media accounts. When quizzed about details never made public about how Elaine Dardine's body was found, Sells initially replied inaccurately, then blurted out the correct response. It's possible he merely deduced the right answer. Duncan said, Sells also insisted he shot Keith Dardine in a certain seat of the victim's car, but evidence disproved that. There was a lot of ambiguity in his claims, Duncan said, but there also was nothing about what he said that would make his guilt completely discountable. Sells offered to be escorted back to Illinois to show where he hid key evidence, but, said Duncan, it became clear Texas was not going to let him leave the state. So the prosecutor was stymied unwilling to pin cells with the Ena killings based on a questionable confession and no physical evidence. He could have been the killer, Duncan said, but there's a fair possibility that the actual killer may still be out there. It's that kind of case that will haunt everyone involved, he said. There's just no end to that. 8. The Bear Brook Murders The Bear Brook Murders, one of the most infamous cold cases in American history, was broken open today by investigators. But in a strange twist, they have honed in on the killer, but still lack the identities of the four victims found stuffed in barrels in the New Hampshire woods. A man known as Robert Evans in the 1970s and early 1980s in New Hampshire was the biological father of child two, one of the four victims. The man known as Evans also was an employee of the owner of the property where the bodies were discovered. In a complicated investigative web, it was the connection to two other missing persons cases in New Hampshire and a completely separate murder in California, which have connected the dots of a serial killer who was apparently stalking multiple states from coast to coast, and likely has at least a half dozen victims over a decade, and potentially more. The killer named Evans went by at least four other names, and his true identity remains unknown. A startling investigation by the New Hampshire and California authorities, 
The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children and others have started to paint a horrifying portrait of an unknown size, though they are starting to understand its shape. This is a guy who was a chameleon, said Jeffrey Strolzin, chief of the homicide unit for the New Hampshire Attorney General's office. We are confident we have our killer. We now want to ID these victims. When you can't identify your victims, you generally can't get anywhere, he added. In this case, it was the opposite. Now we need to identify and try to find all of his victims. Robert Evans was initially sought in connection with the disappearance of Denise Bodin and her infant daughter Dawn in November 1981, authorities said. Evans next popped up in California in 1985, but he was named Curtis Kimball on the West Coast, and he was with a girl going by the name of Lisa. Denise Bodin had disappeared along the way, somehow. A series of arrests and aliases marked the killer's trail. He was still Curtis Kimball in 1985, at the time of a DWI. He was Gordon Curtis Jensen when working in an RV park, and when he abandoned the little girl Lisa in 1986. A family at the RV park adopted the girl. The story of abuse she told her new family and authorities led to felony arrest warrants for him. The same man, now known as Jerry Mockerman, was picked up by authorities in 1988. He was convicted in 1989 and sentenced to three years in prison. He served 18 months, before he was paroled, and absconded. The killer, whatever his new name, disappeared for 12 years. The man resurfaced with the name Lawrence William Vanner in 2001. Doing odd jobs as a handyman, he met a woman named Unsoon June, whose roof he repaired. They were married in an unofficial backyard ceremony in August 2001. June went missing in September 2002, and her body was found in her basement weeks later. The husband was arrested that November and charged with murder, and he was eventually convicted and sentenced to 15 years to life in prison. The prisoner known in the legal system as Curtis Kimball died in a California prison on December 28, 2010. It is not known how old he was since he gave birth dates throughout his life that ranged from 1936 to 1952, depending on what alias he was using, authorities said. Back in New Hampshire, the Bear Brook case was mired in infamy, and dead ends. The first barrel was found by hunters near Bear Brook State Park in the New Hampshire woods in November 1985. Inside the 55-gallon drum were the bodies of a woman and a young girl. The case quickly went nowhere. Despite New Hampshire authorities committing hundreds of hours to try and identify the two females, 15 years later, in 2000, investigators combing the woods for clues on the long unsolved case came upon the unthinkable, just a short distance away, yet another barrel. This one contained the bodies of two more little girls. For 15 years more, the trail led nowhere beyond those woods outside Allenstown, New Hampshire. DNA early on established the woman and two of the girls were closely related, perhaps mother and daughters, or siblings. All four victims lived in New Hampshire together prior to their deaths, they found. The middle child, however, was different. She had likely come from somewhere in the middle of the country. One investigative hope was oxygen isotope analysis, completed in 2015. The tests of the isotopes in the remains determined all four had lived together in the northeast drinking the same water marked by a particular chemical signature. DNA and other findings from the remains have narrowed down the interrelationships. 2. The woman likely had dark, wavy hair and was between 22 and 33 years old. The oldest girl in the same barrel was 10 years old at the time of death. The youngest victim, who was also related, was 2 or 3 years old and had a large gap in the front of her teeth. The unrelated middle child was three or four years old and had a different appearance. According to the latest sketch, that middle child is now confirmed to be the biological daughter of the killer, whether he is known as Evans, Kimball, Jensen or whatever other names he used in his decades of mayhem. The link was the little girl he abandoned, then known as Lisa Jensen. Curious about her barely remembered past and the man she had been with for the cross-country travel, she took a genetic test. It was linked to people in New Hampshire, people who turned out to be her cousins and her grandfather. Further testing in contact with police established an incredible connection. She was Dawn Bodin, the little girl last seen on the East Coast in 1981. The woman, now with a happily married life including three children of her own, released a statement through authorities at the press conference this morning. I am so grateful to be reunited with my grandfather and cousins. 
she said, calling it an incredulous story. Please turn your attention to the unidentified victims. Police now believe Evans killed at least six people, Denise Baudin, the four Bearbrook victims and June, whose murder was the one for which he was actually caught. However, the biological mother of the daughter he killed and placed in the barrel remains unknown and unaccounted for. Elizabeth Evans is a name that appears occasionally in documents, but investigators are unsure of her real identity. All the known victims were killed with blunt force trauma. Some were dismembered. Frankly, we do not know the true identity of the subject right now, said Sergeant Michael Kokoski of the New Hampshire State Police. Little investigative clues have mounted, however, based on things he said in his history, they believe he may have been in the military perhaps in the U.S. Navy, prior to appearing on the New Hampshire radar in 1977. Heavy drinking marked his entire life, including the DWIs, and he also was a drifter, with only months at a time in the same place. Almost everyone he had met along his travels described him as aloof and strange. Most chillingly, perhaps, investigators are not only unsure of what the killer's real name is, but they're also unsure of his travels. Beyond California and New Hampshire, he stole a car in Idaho. He is also believed to have potential connections in a wide swath of the rest of the country, Washington, Oregon, Arizona, Wyoming, Colorado, Texas, Hawaii, Missouri, Louisiana, Georgia and Virginia. 9. The Bowles Family, Crestline, California is a small mountain town located in the popular San Bernardino Mountains of Southern California. Like most of the towns of the mountains of San Bernardino there is a sizable amount of second homes or cabins that are only used on occasion by the owners, making the community a very quiet and peaceful place to live. The dense woods on the mountains allows for secluded cabins to be tucked away among the trees. The Bowles family was just one of the many part-timers on the mountain. They had recently purchased a small cabin on the outskirts of town to escape the hustle and bustle of Orange County on the weekends. The weekend of August 13, 1965, the family of four had piled into the car and made their way up the winding mountain roads to their new slice of tranquility. When the James, 41, Darlene, 37, and the two boys, Tommy, 13, and Bobby, 12, hadn't returned to their full-time residence in Orange County by Monday the 16th extended family started to worry. The cabin was newly built and still didn't have a phone line to call. The mothers of the two parents grew increasing concerned and they called Darlene's brother, Floyd, who in turn contacted the construction company who had built the cabin to see if they could go by and check on the family. Floyd never heard back. Next he contacted the San Bernardino Sheriff's Office who said they would pass on the wellness check to the local substation, but again Floyd didn't hear back. Completely frustrated Floyd decided to check himself and asked an employee of his familiar with the area to go with him. Floyd and his employee reached the cabin at about 5 p.m. Once there they noticed that neither family car was in the driveway and walked up on the deck to look in the windows. Through the window Floyd saw Barbara, the family dog on the couch covered in blood and not moving. Floyd tried the door and found it unlocked. He entered the small cabin and moving towards the master bedroom he saw what had become of his sister and her family. At 5.10 p.m. the two men sped off and found the nearest sheriff substation to report the gruesome discovery. When the investigating officers arrived they found the scene exactly as Floyd had described it. The family dog dead in the living room along with pairs of slippers, shoes and socks on the living room floor. The four family members all dead in the master bedroom, each riddled with bullets. James was laying in his back on the floor of the bedroom in a pool of blood. Thirteen-year-old Bobby was found in a sitting position back to the wall. Darlene was found in a crouched position in the closet indicting she had been shielding her youngest son Tommy at the time of their deaths. Detectives found blood smears in the living room and dinette area which seemed to lead to the back bedroom. 35. 22 caliber shell casings were found in the cabin. Five in the living room and 30 in the bedroom where the family was slain. Blood smears on the bedding in the master bedroom seemed to indicate that a weapon may have been wiped clean on the bed. Detectives were also able to find footprints in size 11 men's in the cabin. Detectives searched outside the cabin for footprints, but it has rained Sunday, the night before the bodies were discovered so they had no luck. The wallet James carried was found in the cabin but contained no money, which was deemed unusual.
About 65 yards away the car was located and detectives staked it out for a while in case the suspect returned but again, no luck. The local paper boy confirmed that the car had been there since at least 6 a.m. on Sunday August 15 when he did his morning deliveries. When the bodies of the family members were examined each one had multiple gunshot wounds, all had numerous fatal wounds to the head and chest area as well as wounds to limbs and extremities. A canvas of the area turned up very little as most other cabins within reasonable distance were part-timers and had been empty that weekend. The only exception the first day of canvassing was the Ogles who had seen James on the evening of Saturday the 14th. He seemed in good spirits and they had chatted for a few minutes before they had said their goodbyes. The Ogles hadn't heard anything unusual, but said they probably wouldn't have as there was a very large party happening a few streets away and they had been trying to ignore the noise. Another witness said the family ate dinner at the local San Moritz club Saturday evening and James seemed visibly upset after making a phone call. Yet another contact stated James had told them the family was going to have a visitor around 8 p.m. on the evening of Saturday the 14th. Detectives contacted many other full-time residents of the town and part-timers who may have been around on that fateful weekend. Also questioned were friends, family, and co-workers of the couple. Detectives got lots of potential leads, but none of the evidence was ever able to be conclusively tied to anyone. Suspects, several suspects with no motive but were in the vicinity were vetted and cleared. Darlene's ex-husband, Harvey M. Fulton, was also a suspect. Rumors abound at Hughes Aircraft, where both Darlene and James worked, that Fulton had harassed them. Even Darlene's family was also suspected at one point. The most promising suspect came in the form of George Robert Stewart who was wanted on a mental warrant from Alabama where he was suspected in the murder of the Evans brothers two young boys he had molested while living with their family. He had worked at a church camp on the mountain in the nearby area of Twin Peaks. The camp confirmed they had been closed that particular weekend so he was free to do as he wished. He had been diagnosed a psychopath and had strong religious fervor. In 1967, the sheriff's department was advised that Stewart was now wanted now for child molesting and interstate flight to avoid prosecution. He was arrested in September 1967 in Arlington. TX and detectives flew down to interview him. He was given a polygraph and showed deception in the results, but continued to deny involvement, having no hard evidence to tie Stewart to the murdered family, except the possible motive of meeting the young boys and possibly following them home. So detectives from Mobile took Stewart back to Alabama to question him in their own investigations. He was released on bail in Alabama after a witness in his molestation case refused to testify. Stewart is currently serving time in Illinois related to sex crimes against children. The brutal murders of the Bulls family is still unsolved. 10. The Feeney Family John Feeney was so pleased with the gift he'd bought for his 17-month-old daughter that he showed it to his high school chemistry students. It was a pop-up book, recalled one of them, Devin Phillips. I just remember him reading the book to the class. It's uncertain, though, whether young Jennifer ever got to enjoy her present. Within two days, the toddler was found dead along with her brother, 6-year-old Tyler, and 36-year-old mother, Cheryl. Her father is accused of strangling her with a shoelace and beating the life from her brother and mother with a pipe. The state is seeking the death penalty on three counts of first-degree murder. The trial begins Tuesday. Feeney, 36, claims he was at a teacher's conference at the Lake of the Ozarks, about 90 miles northeast of Springfield, when his wife and children were killed February 26, 1995. Thus far, the state has stumbled in trying to gather evidence to the contrary. In the 14 months prosecutors took to get an indictment, Feeney lived in his home, repeatedly walking through the murder scene. An insurance investigator found Feeney was not at fault in the deaths, allowing him to collect insurance money for 300 items he said were stolen in the attack. Assistant Green County Prosecutor Dara Moore acknowledges the case is not clear-cut. In numerous pre-trial hearings, no mention has been made of any physical evidence linking Feeney to the crime scene and Moore has said no witness puts Feeney in Springfield around the time of the slayings. But there was a witness when the grand jury handed up its indictment in April. That man, a convenience store clerk named Ron Gann, is certain to play a central role in the trial, which is expected to last two weeks. Defense attorneys initially wanted a judge to suppress Gann's testimony. Under oath, 
he claimed to have sold gas to a man resembling Feeney in the early morning hours after his family was killed. Gan also said he remembered Feeney's car, a red Mustang convertible. Gan's story underscore through depositions, police interviews and grand jury queries underscore was pocked with inconsistencies. Nevertheless, Judge J. Miles Sweeney ruled August 21st that Gan could testify and the jury would decide whether to believe his story. Then, a twist. The defense found timesheets that showed Gan was not even working during the hours he was supposed to have waited on Feeney. It was a blow to the prosecution, which lost its only witness. And it was a coup for the defense, which plans to call Gan to the stand to highlight problems in the investigation. The prosecution case now seems to rest on character assault. The state is expected to call witnesses who will testify Feeney had extramarital affairs and was not an attentive father. Neither Moore nor lead defense attorney Sean asked as he could comment on the trial because of a gag order imposed last week by the judge. But that did not stop residents from buzzing about the case, which many people have called Springfield's Simpson trial. The local cable station said last week it would broadcast the trial live using a feed from Core TV. That news was not welcomed at Glendale High School where Feeney was working at the time of the slayings. There will be no classroom discussion and there will be no viewing of TV, not a 30 seconds worth, Principal Barbara Buffington said. That situation has impacted us as much as it's going to. About a year after the murders, Feeney was arrested and tried on three counts of first-degree murder. The prosecution highlighted Feeney's dubious moral character and pointed out that he had cashed a $500,000 life and property insurance policy following the murders. With a lack of physical evidence, however, Feeney was found not guilty and released. Still, some have continued to speculate that Feeney was involved in his family's deaths. One theory based on the fact that Tyler was found to have been infected with hepatitis B before his death, suggests that Feeney may have had an accomplice or hitman do the job.